Hello everyone, my name is Chris Mason and I'll be talking today about the ButterFS file system. When we started the ButterFS file system, we really wanted to lay out a clear set of reasons why we were adding a new file system to Linux. This was especially important because the existing file systems are really generally very good. And so we wanted to make a general purpose file system that scaled very well to large storage. We knew that the development would take some time and we wanted to make sure that it would be able to scale to the storage not just that we had today, but storage that was uh, available in the future. So it was very important to us to focus on features that the existing file systems were missing. It's generally fairly easy to make the existing file systems faster, but adding new features within the constraints of their disk format uh, can be significantly more difficult. So one of the things that we wanted to do was focus on the administrator, make something that was very easy, very fault tolerant, uh, something that was easy to configure and maintain over time, even as they were using the massive storage systems that we knew were coming out. Performance was important. You need to make sure that we're not dramatically slower than any of the existing file systems. But again, because the existing file systems are so good, uh, we did not really want to go out and have a performance race with everyone. Uh, generally, most of the file systems run at disk speed anyway. Uh, so while we wanted to perform well, we really wanted to make sure that it was the features that made ButterFS stand out from everything else. So getting on to those features, uh, the first one is really a requirement today in the, existing, in the new file systems in Linux. It has to be extent-based. And what this means is that instead of recording every single individual block that a file might use, we record a range of blocks. So instead of having one meta metadata entry for every 4K of the file, uh, we'll record that a 1 meg range or a 256 meg range, very large ranges of the storage are in use by a particular offset in a particular file. It makes the metadata itself much more efficient and allows us to record more information for each extent than we otherwise might have been able to do. We have copy on write, metadata and data. And what this means is that instead of directly overwriting any piece of metadata or any piece of data, we write any changes to a new location and we change the things that point to uh, that block or at that extent, uh, we change them to point to the new location. And this allows us to do many more advanced things, including the snapshotting and the checksumming uh, that really make ButterFS stand out. So we have very space efficient packing of small files, even though storage has become much larger uh, a lot of the files that we're putting onto it really haven't. And so there are a number of workloads where the workload itself is dominated by files that are quite small. And ButterFS is able to pack these together into the metadata B tree and save a great deal of space. We also have optional transparent compression. Uh, right now we do that with Zlib. Uh, but as a file is written or read, uh, we have the ability to go ahead and compress or uncompress it and save quite a bit of space. And the way this works internally is that it's spread out across the CPUs on the system. And so even though compression does use a good amount of CPU time, we're still able to perform very well because we're able to make use of the large number of sockets that systems tend to have. One of the very important features is integrity checksumming both for data and metadata. This means that we're able to, when we read blocks from the disk, we're able to tell whether or not it's the correct data. And this is very important because uh, very often, RAID systems are able to deal with hardware errors where a given sector read fails, uh, but they might not be able to detect when the storage just returns the wrong thing. And with the integrity checksumming in ButterFS, we're able to detect incorrect data being re returned from the storage, and if you're in a redundant configuration, we're able to ask another mirror if it might have a good copy of that data. Writable snapshots are one of the core features of the file system. It's really one of the things that the rest of the file system is built on. It was important that we be able to do snapshotting, uh, not just read only, but also have the snapshots writable and snapshotable again. Uh, in general, they're very efficient. We are able to have a large number of snapshots on the file system without degrading performance. And it's really one of the core things that the file system is built on. Online resize, defragmentation, device management, these were all added very early on in the file system as a way to show that the copy on write system that we have is able to add features that are difficult in other file systems. So we can online extend 
very, very quickly and make a file system larger. But we can also make the file system smaller. We can move everything that's using any arbitrary block in the file system. We can move uh, the users of that block to somewhere else so that we're able to reclaim space and we're able to defragment files to make sure that their layout is efficient. And we're also able to add and remove devices online. So if your file system is made up of five or six devices, you can add more, you can take some out. Any blocks that are in use uh, on a device that you want to remove, we'll go ahead and move those blocks off to other devices. And it all happens online without uh, the administrator having to do anything special to the file system itself. We do have multiple device support, uh, so we're able to have a pool of storage, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later. One of the very interesting features is we have the ability to do an offline uh, conversion from Extended 3 or Extended 4. And what this allows you to do is create a ButterFS file system in the free space of your Extended 3 and Extended 4 file system. And really all we do is take references on uh, the, the blocks for the files in Extended 3 and Extended 4. So we share the data blocks, we don't duplicate those. And we save the original state of the file system when it was Extended 3 as a snapshot inside of ButterFS. So not only can you convert, but if uh, you don't like the end result, uh, you can go back. You can undo the conversion and end up with your original Extended 3 or Extended 4 file system. If you do like the conversion, uh, you can just delete that snapshot and then the conversion is permanent. Another feature that we have that uh, very few other file systems do is a specialized log for synchronous operations, and I'll talk about that more in a later slide. ButterFS status is that uh, we were included in 2.6.29. Generally, we're usable in many workloads, as is shown by the MIGO distribution using ButterFS by default. We're generally stable. We don't have uh, future disk format changes planned that are not compatible with what we have now. Uh, and this one's really important. Our development team includes many different companies and individuals. So when ButterFS was started, we knew that we would really only succeed if we were able to bring on a number of different Linux companies and development teams. And so we have major contributions from Intel and Red Hat. Uh, HP helped quite a bit with the design of the file system and with some testing early on. IBM contributes uh, patches and testing, uh, along with a number of other companies. Uh, that really make the file system much stronger because we have input from a number of different teams and we also, of course, have contributions and testing. So some of the new things we've done this year are uh, much better support for running out of space on the file system. In the past, we would crash and uh, now we are able to continue on gracefully. We have support for asynchronous I.O. and direct I.O., which is a very important feature for database workloads and for virtualization. And then another very important feature that uh, was added by Red Hat in the last year is something that I call snapshot assisted upgrades. What this allows you to do is to take a snapshot of your file system before an upgrade starts, and then if for whatever reason you don't like the upgrade, uh, we make it possible to reset the default of what gets mounted on your next boot so that you can go back to the way the file system was before. So it makes it much easier to safely do an upgrade and to be able to go back or even just copy a file off from before the upgrade was done. The ButterFS B-Tree is really the core of everything that the file system does. It is a very generic key and value uh, pair storage system. And basically what, the, what this means is that we made a, a very genetic, generic data structure to uh, index all of the file system metadata. And then uh, we add different ways of using that data structure for the different types of metadata that are out there. And it's important because it made it possible for us to very quickly implement a lot of different features using the same uh, generic B-Tree as the backing store for it. One of the uh, most important parts about this is the copy-on-write system that we use for crash safety. Basically, because we never overwrite existing blocks, we always write to a new location, uh, we're able to very quickly recover after a crash because we never update the main pointer that points to the new location until everything is consistent. Uh, so we don't have, uh, at least for the core B-Tree itself, a very complicated log that uh, needs to be replayed like Extended 3 or Extended 4 do. Uh, the copy on write B-Tree solves that for us very nicely. We do store in each uh, B-Tree block header and in every pointer in the B-Tree uh, the transaction ID that created that block. 
Now, this is very important, and I'll talk about this in a later slide, because it allows us to efficiently search for things that have changed recently. The metadata from different files and directories is mixed together in the B-tree blocks. And what this allows us to do is we don't have a specialized block for each file or for each directory in the system, like extended 3 or extended 2 might have. Uh, we really mix them all together. And the keys in the B-tree allow us to search for things uh, to find what we're looking for. And they also define the ordering so that uh, an inode for a file will end up next to the file data pointers itself. What's nice is that uh, it's very compact. Uh, if you remove things from a directory, the directory entries uh, are not wasted. There's no wasted space. Directories and the files inside those directories will stay together in a block as long as the directory is very small. So it's very convenient and very easy to use. As I said, the key ordering is what keeps uh, things that are related close together in the B tree, and this is important because we want to be able to do a lookup and uh, find things related to a file right next to uh, the inode or whatever else we might find. So this is a short graph trying to show basically just that the B tree blocks share things from different files and different directories together. So inside of a single block, you might find directory items for slash Etsy. You might find the inode for slash Etsy slash FS tab. You might find the access control lists, and you might even find the inline data that contain the file itself, because this file is generally very small. So these all get packed together. And the way we do it inside the B tree is we have a key. The key has three different parts, and these different parts mean different things depending on what you're looking up. Uh, but they allow us to pack everything together very efficiently. This graph is meant to demonstrate how we have transaction IDs inside the B tree and exactly how it allows us to efficiently search for things that have recently changed. And so in this graph, we have at the very top uh, the root B tree pointer. And we can see that its transaction ID is 256. That means it was created in transaction 256. Now, because we're copy on write, every block is only written once. So we know that the creation date is exactly the same as the, the time that it was modified. Inside each pointer in this root block, there is uh, a block number. So in this example, it's node N1 and the transaction ID of that block. So we can see that node N1 was created in transaction ID 256. So when we go down to node N1, uh, we see it has a pointer to a leaf that was created in transaction 256. Because we're copy on write, these things tend to bubble up. You can't have a leaf uh, with a transaction ID that is greater than the transaction ID of the node that points to it. So we get all the way down into the leaf, and we, file file, we find the file extent pointer uh, F1 with transaction ID 256. Now on the other side, we go all the way back up to the root, and we have uh, another node, node N2, with transaction ID 128. And the graph doesn't exactly show it, but in the block pointer in the root that points down to node N2, we include that transaction ID. So if we know that our backup was taken on transaction ID, say, 192, we know that we don't need to read node N2 to find new items in the file system. We know node N2 was modified in transaction ID 128. If we know our backup was from transaction 192, we could ignore that entire subtree. And so because of the system, we're able to very quickly find things that have changed without doing very much disk I.O. Snapshots and subvolumes. This is one of the main features of ButterFS that makes it different from the other Linux file systems. And it's a little bit confusing because uh, the terms are somewhat vague, but a snapshot is Sorry, I that over. A subvolume is basically a directory that can be snapshot. It's really not different from a directory at all. The only thing that makes it special is that there is enough extra metadata attached to it that we're able to take a snapshot of it. Uh, it's very efficient. Making a subvolume is really no less efficient than making a directory, but you can take a snapshot of it. If you have an individual file in the file system that you want to clone without taking a full snapshot, uh, there is an IOCTL that we've added that has been added to the util Linux utility. Uh, so you can use cp reflink to take a clone of an individual file. What happens when you clone a file is we go ahead and read all of the block pointers in that file. And we 
uh, copy the block pointers. So with a when we clone a file, we make a copy of all the block pointers in that file and take extra references on all of those blocks. This is uh, somewhat less efficient than a full snapshot because we might have to read more blocks than if we were to just take a snapshot of a single directory, a single B-tree block. The B-tree block snapshots are very quick, but they also cover many more things. Uh, one of the important things about the ButterFS metadata is that we have these reference counts and we also have back references that track every extent, every file data extent, and every B-tree block. This allows us to very quickly, when we know a given block on a disk is bad, it allows us to very quickly go off and find anything that might be referencing that block. As I said before, snapshots can be written and snapshotted again, uh, but they are not, unfortunately, not suitable for continuous data protection. That's somewhere where you want to be able to find every single revision that you've ever made to a given file, and that's not something that ButterFS does very well. ButterFS does include support for multiple devices. What we do is we have a pool of available storage, and new logical address space is allocated out of that pool with a specific RAID configuration. It might be RAID 0 or RAID 1 or RAID 10, and a specific use, whether it's metadata or data. Uh, we do have support in the works for RAID 5 and RAID 6, and what we do is we allocate from the storage pool pool in relatively large chunks, about one gigabyte or more. And it allows us to mix devices together in size and speed. And we show this better on the next slide. We have a block group. Uh, I call it block group one here. It's in RAID 1, and you can see it's allocated across all four drives. And then we have another block group. I call it block group two, uh, and that one is RAID 1. And we can see it's just allocate, allocated across two of the drives because it's a simple mirror. We have some free space on drives 3 and drive 4, and then block group 3, which is also RAID 0, is again across all four drives. And so when we add more space, we'll just carve off little chunks as we need to in order to satisfy the needs of the data we're storing. ButterFS is very well suited to thin provisioning because we can very easily migrate uh, data and metadata off of parts of the file system and then give that back to the underlying storage in very large chunks. And this is possible with something called discard support, which is a relatively new feature in the kernel that allows the file systems to tell the underlying storage that a given area is unused. And in thin provisioning setups, uh, it's very important to be able to reclaim that space so that the underlying RAID controller or whatever is providing the thin provisioning is able to efficiently hand that space off to other users. We also have uh, a mount-o discard option in ButterFS that at runtime notifies the storage that given blocks are unused as we free them. This is useful too. Uh, it works in a much smaller unit and it's much more applicable to SSDs than it is to the large RAID controllers. So ButterFS has a synchronous operations uh, optimization where we want to be able to very quickly service synchronous file writes, either via F-Sync or O-Sync writes. We want to be able to service those without impacting the rest of the file system. And this is something where extended three uh, cause a lot of problems because when you f-sync a file in the default extended three mount options, uh, what tends to happen is every other write that the file system has pending is done at the same time. And so if you're doing a synchronous workload alongside a big streaming write, everything will get very slow because everything gets written to the disk for every f-sync. So ButterFS has a specialized logging tree. And what this allows us to do is any F-Sync or O-Sync operation on a file writes only the metadata for that one file. It does not trigger write back of any other blocks, and it also includes enough metadata to recreate that file, so you don't need to separately F-Sync the directory. So applications that are accustomed to needing to F-Sync multiple things as they rename files, uh, that's not really required on ButterFS. You just need to F-Sync that one file and everything you've done to create that file in the file system will get recorded to the disk. So some of the new features in ButterFS uh, that are coming down the pipe, one of them that is not in the file system yet, but that we're currently working on, is the hot and cold extent migration. These are some patches contributed by IBM. And what they do is they are tracking uh, which extents in the file system are used the most often. And when they find an extent that is particularly hot, used particularly often, they migrate it to the fastest device in the file system. So the idea is that the administrator identifies a device or a pool of devices as very fast, 
and we go ahead and make sure that the most frequently used extents live on those devices. What's nice is that they are using the existing copy and write infrastructure to trigger the migration. Uh, so the actual code that does the migration is very, very simple because it's leveraging the defragmentation and everything that's already in the file system just to move things over to a new location. So in terms of pending projects that we have on the file system, I've broken it up into two different parts. Uh, the next slide is projects that take quite a long time to finish, and this one is a list of some of the shorter projects that we have pending right now where people who are interested in contributing might pick these up and learn a lot about the file system or kernel programming in general. Uh, one of the very easy ones is adding a dedicated metadata or data, data drive. The idea here is that uh, we have a drive that we know is very fast, and so we want to put our C key things like metadata access only onto that drive. Uh, the required disk format changes for this are already in place. We just need a little bit of management code in the kernel to make use of it. Another very easy one would be read-only snapshots. Uh, this is something that a lot of people have been asking for. I thought it was important from the beginning that the snapshots be writable, but apparently uh, a lot of people want to be able to have a read-only, permanent, unchanging version of the, the data. And so this is also very easy. We just need some extra code in the kernel to enforce it. I'd like to add some per file directory, per file or per directory controls for turning off copy on write for data or turning on and off compression. Uh, we have mod options for this now, uh, but some people would like it to be a little bit more fine-grained. Chunk tree backups are pretty important. The chunk tree is the logical address mapping. So that's how we have a logical address for a block or an extent in the file system. And the chunk tree is what translates that to a specific area of the disk. And when the chunk tree gets lost, uh, we basically lose all ability to access our data, even if the rest of the file blocks are fine. So uh, we'd like to add support for backing this up to separate media uh, just to make sure that this critical piece of metadata is maintained. I mentioned before how easy it is to find newly modified files in ButterFS, and we'd like to have this integrated into rsync. I certainly think it would make it easier to use. Uh, the Atomic Write API, uh, that's something some of the newer solid state storage out there is able to do atomic writes in much larger chunks than traditional hard drives can. Uh, ButterFS can very easily make use of this. Uh, we just need an API to actually get it off into user land. The, I mentioned before how we have back references so that we know exactly which files or directories are affected by a given piece of a given sector on a drive. Uh, right now it's somewhat labor intensive to actually do that translation, so we'd like some utilities to make it easier to find uh, files or directories affected by a given block. Scrubbing utilities are something that uh, all of the major RAID arrays include. Basically they are quietly, silently making sure that the blocks on the disk are correct whenever they, uh, whenever they have some idle time. And we'd like to do that in ButterFS as well to make sure that we find errors before uh, drives fail, because usually when one drive fails, it's very often that you'll find an error on the other drive while you're trying to do the RAID reconstruction. We'd also like to add some better utilities to make use of the discard and trim support. Basically the things I was talking about for thin provisioning before, uh, we'd like to go ahead and make those much easier to use in the file system. And I added benchmarking to both the short and long project list uh, because there are always short benchmarks that you can do to make sure that we're performing well, uh, but we also appreciate long-term benchmarking efforts like that done by IBM, so more of that would definitely be wonderful. The long project list is, uh, these are harder tasks that will take a little bit longer for people to do. I would expect someone to uh, start on the short project list and after they've had some good success, maybe tackle one of these. Uh, one of the biggest ones is deduplication. This is something that we could easily support in the file system itself. Uh, we have all of the reference counting that we need to be able to uh, combine things that are identical blocks. Uh, but we definitely need some more infrastructure in the kernel to be able to make use of it at runtime. We'd love to do more tracking of I.O. errors on a per-device basis so that we can make intelli intelligent decisions about when it's time to kick out a bad drive. The random write performance tuning is especially important in database workloads and in virtualization workloads. Uh, right now we kind of cheat on that a little bit and suggest that for database or virtualization it's much better to turn off the copy on write for data blocks. Uh, that's not ideal, uh, so 
there is a lot of research to be done in terms of performing well for random write workloads. I mentioned the hot data migration patches from IBM. Uh, there is definitely a lot of work, a lot of interesting work to do in terms of front end caching, solid state storage. That's definitely something that we'll be investigating over the next year. Online file system checkers. My, my long term goal for the file system check code is to do as little as possible offline and to shovel uh, a lot of the work where you're just making sure that directories are correct and file link counts are correct and things like that uh, into an online state. The kernel and the application might uh, cooperate in terms of making sure that things are correct, but doing it while the system is online and available. The free inode number cache, as file systems grow very large, uh, actually finding a free inode number is something that uh, will limit performance, and so we want to do some better caching of that to make sure that it performs well in the future. Uh, snapshot aware file defragmentation. Right now when you defragment a file, if there are snapshots of that file, it will end up uh, creating a second copy of the file, which isn't exactly what we want. A defrag doesn't really change the file, it just reorganizes the blocks. We want to make sure that every snapshot is, uh, uses the defragmented version instead of breaking the snapshot. We definitely do need to improve uh, lock contention in the vtree. It's very good right now, uh, but as you have much larger systems, we're going to be banging into the metadata locks that we have. And this gets into the benchmarking again in terms of long-term benchmarking projects. So there is a ButterFS wiki where you can find more information on these projects and other things, uh, and also on the core features of the file system. And please don't hesitate to email me. It's chris.mason at oracle.com, and there's also a ButterFS mailing list listed on the wiki. Thanks again for listening, and I hope to see you on the mailing list.